This is the Bolsheviks come to power, the revolution of 1917 in Petrograd by Alexander Rabinowitch. Chapter one, the July uprising. Sorry, I just have to scroll to chapter one here. Okay, the July uprising. Chapter 1. Still some 25 miles from the capital, the mud-spattered, dark green carriages of the Finnish railway train wound their way through pine and fir-covered, boulder-strewn hills, broken here and there by clusters of tidy log cottages. It was the first run of the morning, seated on hard benches, smooth from wear, in a dilapidated carriage occupied mainly by respectably dressed summer residents of the Finnish countryside, commuting to work in Petrograd. Lenin, Lenin his younger sister Maria, and his comrades Bonch Bruvich, an authority on Russian religious sects who had been active in the Russian Social Democratic Party from its earliest years, and Savaliev the university-educated son of a minor noble, also a longtime party member, talked together anima animatedly. About nine o'clock, the train crossed the Sestra River, a narrow, meandering stream that served as a, as a boundary between Finland and Russia. Minutes later, it slowed to a stop at the small border station of Belustrov. Up the track, a machinist uncoupled the locomotive, which, chugging and hissing rhythmically, moved off slowly to take on wood and water. Conversation between Lenin and his companions was interrupted at this point by an officious border inspector who popped into their, their compartment and commanded sharply, Documents, show your documents, have them ready. Many years later, Bonch Bruvich recalled his uneasiness as he, is in his friend, as he and his friends handed their papers to the waiting inspector. Lenin was traveling on his own passport. Would the name Ulyanov arouse suspicion? The inspector stamped all four passports with only a perfunctory glance and hurried on. During the 20-minute stopover at Belustrov, Bonch Bruvich rushed off to fetch the morning papers. While Lenin, Savaliev, and Maria Ilinichna, or Ilinichna ordered coffee at the station buffet. Bonch Bruvich soon returned with several late editions, and Lenin bounced on them for news of the uprising in Petrograd, or pounced on them for news of the uprising in Petrograd. Prominent stories in almost all the papers carried details of the previous day's events. From all indications, it appeared that the movement of armed soldiers and factory workers into the streets had been triggered in mid-afternoon by soldiers of the several thousand man 1st Machine Gun Regiment. One or two machine gunners had been dispatched to each major factory and military unit, where, more often than not, their appeals for insurrection had been greeted with enthusiasm. By early evening, upper-class citizens had disappeared from downtown streets, and thousands of soldiers in full battle dress, and workers carrying banners, many of the latter accompanied by their families, were demonstrating outside the Marinsky and Tarita palaces, headquarters of the provisional government and the Soviet, respectively, demanding the transfer of power to the Soviet. According to these accounts, large groups of rebelling workers and soldiers had gone out of their way to parade past Bolshevik headquarters in the Kshinskaya mansion, a sign of Bolshevik involvement in preparation of the uprising and of the authority of the party among the Petrograd masses. Insurgents and in motor cars commandeered on the streets and in military trucks, bristling with machine guns and decorated with red banners, had been observed weaving about the city all evening unhindered. There were numerous reports of random rifle and machine gun fire in widely scattered areas. 
The extent of casualties, casualties was as yet unknown. At rail stations, long lines of alarmed, well-dressed Petrograders queued up for tickets and prepared to leave the city. With the consent of the guards on duty, insurgent forces had taken control of the psychologically and strategically important Peter and Paul Fortress. According to last-minute dispatches, a group of rebel sol soldiers had made an unsuccessful attempt to capture War Minister Kerensky. In addition, the left appeared to have secured a major victory in the workers' section of the Petrograd Soviet, which on the previous evening had broken with the leadership of the Central Soviet organs by endorsing the idea of transferring power to the Soviets and forming a commission to help give the mass movement a peaceful and organized character. At the start of the trouble, the government and the Soviet had appealed to soldiers and workers not to go into the streets. After it was clear that this effort had failed, the commander of the Petrograd military district, General Peter Polovtsev, a youthful but tough and already much decorated cavalry officer, had urgently called on units of the garrison to restore order in the streets. However, troops not participating in the uprising were ignoring his directives. Late in the evening, Polovtsev had published a ban on further demonstrations of any kind. Meanwhile, both the cabinet and the all-Russian executive committees had been meeting in emergency sessions on and off throughout the night in connection with the expanding crisis. In these early reports, there was a little consens consensus about what had sparked the uprising. One of the days featured stories with the several cadets had resigned from the cabinet because of differences with socialist ministers over government policy toward the Ukraine. Some observers took it for granted that the development or that the developing insurrection was directly related to the apparent breakup of the coalition. Thus, a correspondent for the cadet newspaper, Rack suggested that the latter development had provided the opportunity for soldiers in a few military regiments and workers in some factories to demonstrate their preference for the transfer of all power to the Soviets. Other observers attributed the disruptions to dissatisfaction among garrison troops with brutal measures adopted by military authorities to deal with frontline units that refused to advance against the enemy. Despite differences as to the precise issue that had triggered the movement to overthrow the government, virtually all commentators seemed agreed that the Bolsheviks, more than any other political group, were to blame for the trouble. A writer for Izvestia, the newspaper of the Central Executive Committee in the Petrograd Soviet, concluded that a part of the Petrograd uh, proletariat and garrison had come into the streets with arms in hand under the influence of totally irresponsible Bolshevik agitation. In his view, the Bolsheviks were attempting to make use of genuine dissatisfaction and unrest among the proletarian and soldier masses for their own purposes. An editorial in Berzevi uh, Vedomosti, a non-party liberal daily, but the matter more directly, or put the matter more directly. What is this? Queried the writer theoretically or rhetorically. The realization of the unfulfilled Bolshevik lust of June 10th, an armed uprising against the provisional gov government and the majority of the organized democracy. Years later, Blanche Bruvich recalled that during the trip back to Petrograd, Lenin was alarmed most of all by the fury toward the Bolsheviks that was sharply reflected in the July 4th papers. The third warning bell announcing the train's impending departure interrupted Lenin's thoughts. Gulping his coffee and grabbing up the papers, he bounded after his associates, who were hurrying back to their compartment. Once again, settled in his seat, Lenin fell silent, absorbing the rest of the day's important news. On this summer morning, the papers reported more than the usual upset over the increasingly critical shortages of food and fuel. On July 2nd, the Minister of Food Supply, Peshek Kunov, 
had summoned representatives of the Central Petrograd Food Supply Board so that they could be apprised of the growing emergency. The report of a board staff member spelled out the dimensions of the existing food supply breakdown in the Petrograd area. It revealed that even with a reduction in rations, grain reserves would barely last until September. The Food Supply Board had recently purchased 100,000 poods. A pood equals 36 pounds of rice in Vladivostok. Deliveries to Petrograd were delayed by shipping difficulties. Milk deliveries had fallen sharply, largely because of currency problems with Finland, Petrograd's main source of dairy products. Supplies of feed grain and hay reaching Petrograd were a scant third of the necessary minimum. Deliveries of eggs and vegetables were also sharply reduced, in part because authorities in several provinces were not permitting outbound shipments. Um, there was news that the Committee on Fuel Supply had dispatched an emergency report to the mayor of Petrograd, characterizing the situation with regard to wood supplies as catastrophic. The report placed the blame for this shortage on disruptions on rail lines, the overload of the Petrograd railhead, the difficulties with river transport caused by labor problems, and by bad weather. It implied that unless immediate measures to eliminate supply and distribution problems for wood were undertaken, increasing numbers of plants and factories would be forced to shut down for lack of fuel. A related report indicated that the growing fuel emergency had impelled officials of the Moscow Stock Exchange to forward an urgent memorandum to the Ministry of Trade and Industry in Petrograd. The stock exchange officials warned that the shutdown of many factories in the course of the summer because of lack of fuel, of fuel and raw materials was already certain. These officials strongly supported factory owners who insisted on their financial inability to keep on the payroll the many thousands of employees who would soon be forced out of work. In, addi in addition, they predicted that massive labor unrest in major industrial areas was inevitable unless the government mobilized unemployed workers for jobs in agriculture and provided adequate relief benefits. The memorandum urged that the government inform the public of the nature and causes of the developing situation so that laid off workers would not hold factory owners responsible for their situation. The main government committees charged with organizing elections to the Constituent Assembly and preparing a land reform program um, for its adoption were continuing their deliberations. The previous day, the Elections Committee had spent many hours debating how members of the armed forces would be represented in the Assembly. Meanwhile, the Land Reform Committee heard reports from representatives of local land, sorry. Um, meanwhile, the Land Reform Committee heard reports from representatives of local land committees on developments in the provinces. The delegate from Penza province reported that local peasants were putting the principle of socialization of the land into practice spontaneously by seizing and dividing up land according to a labor norm. Efforts by authorities to protect private property were useless, he maintained. No official would dare take action against the peasants for fear of reprisal. A representative from Poltava province declared that the peasants were demanding so socialization of land and were awaiting the implementation of this action through proper legislation measures. Sorry, legislation procedures. It is clear to me, he went on, that to avoid to avoid land seizures is it is necessary for the government to prepare laws on the leasing of land, the prohibition of land purchases and sales, and the conservation of forests. Any delay in the publication of such regulations will make peasants apprehensive 
that land reform will never come. A speaker from the Don region declared that the population of his area was demanding the expropriation of private land holdings without compensation. The Petrograd Soviet's representative on the committee berated the, pro the provisional government for allowing individual ministries to pursue directly conflicting policies in the countryside. He was particularly critical of the Ministry of the Interior, which he said condemned as criminal and anarchical every action taken by the local land reform committees set up by the Ministry of Agriculture. It was reported that a day-long strike of Petrograd lumber workers had been settled. Postal and telegraph workers, however, threatened a walkout beginning at 8 p.m. on July 4th. Clerks and loaders at the main post office were already refusing to work or to allow postmen to make deliveries as the result of a dispute over fringe benefits and a monthly pay raise. At the same time, employees of hotels and rooming houses had joined a citywide waiter strike. Like the waiters, they were calling for an end to hourly wages and demanding instead compensation based on a percentage of revenue in addition to their regular base salary. In the face of the walkout, some restaurant owners were inviting their customers into the kitchen to serve themselves. The major news item from abroad was that in Berlin, Bethman Holweg had resigned as chancellor and had been replaced by George Michaelis. Because of the former chancellor's apparent readiness to entertain the possibility of a negotiated compromise peace, German annexationist and military circles had for many months been applying pressure on Bethmann Holweg to give up his post. His ultimate departure and the appointment of Michaelis, a non-entity selected by General Ludendorff, were striking indications of the military high command's decisive hold over German politics. From Devinsk came a detailed account of a visit to the Northern Front on July 1st and 2nd by Minister of Labor Skobelev and Vladimir Lebedev, acting naval minister. The two were hastily dispatched to the front in the wake of reports that sizable numbers of 5th Army troops were refusing to obey their commander's orders and remained adamantly opposed to engaging the enemy. This was the period between the start of the long-awaited and loudly trumpeted Kerensky Offensive, launched on June 18th, and the decisive German counterattack begun on July 6th. The main thrust of the initial Russian attack had taken place on the southwestern front. At first, it had been modestly successful. When word of the Russian advance reached Petrograd, the nationalist press was jubilant. Yet within days, the demoralized conditions of the army at the front became evident, as units that had been persuaded to move into the attack at its start now refused to fight further. By July 4th, even the inflated official military dispatches could not hide the fact that the initial breakthrough had bogged down and that Russian forces under attack everywhere were suffering heavy losses. On the northern front, the advance was not due to begin until July 8th. A few miles from the front lines, as bands blared, soldiers lined up smartly for review and roared their appro approval as Skobolev trooped the line. Many of these soldiers had seen action and been wounded in earlier campaigns. Since the February Revolution, they had been reading Pravda a Soldatskaya Pravda Okopnea Pravda and the countless other revolutionary anti-war publications with which the Bolsheviks had inundated the battle zones. But now they were preoccupied with thoughts of peace and land and a more equitable political and social order. The objectives of the war were incomprehensible to most of the soldiers, and they were angered by the knowledge that while the Soviet was trying to arrange a just peace, the government was preparing to launch a new offensive. As a result, the soldiers' antagonism toward their officers mounted sharply. Some units were even becoming distrustful of their own elected committees, which, dominated by Mensheviks and SRs,
by and large supported the government's military policies. Nevertheless, while their generals beamed encouragement, the ranks cheered Skobolev. He implored them to give their all for a free Russia, and they responded, Right you are. We are ready to die for liberty. We will do our duty to the end. The soldiers waved banners, bearing the slogans to the attack and down with cowards. A group hoisted Lebedev and Skobolev to their shoulders and conveyed them to their motor car. Yet barely a week later, when the order to attack was given, the same soldiers would throw down their weapons and stumble pell-mell from the battlefield. The train carrying Lenin and his companions began slowing down. At the northernmost outskirts of Petrograd, it passed the lush gardens of the Forest, Forestry Institute and crossed Samsonovsky Prospect, which ran southward through the Vyborg district. Petrograd's large industrial ghetto. The crowded, soot-blackened factories, grimy, vermin-infested, multi-leveled barracks, and run-down workers' shanties that the train was now passing had provided fertile ground for the spread of revolutionary ideas during the first great spurt of Russian industrial development in the last decades of the Tsarist regime. Embittered students from the Forestry Institute had joined their fellows at St. Petersburg University in the outburst of student unrest that had shaken the Russian government at the end of the 1890s. And they were to be found alongside industrial workers manning the barricades in 1905, July 1914, and February 1917. In October 1905, police had directed a hail of bullets at a crowd of workers demonstrating near the southern end of Samsonovsky Prospect at the corner of Butkinskaya Street. Just a short distance away, separated by narrow, muddy, refuse-ridden alleys, were three of Petrograd's larger factories, the Ericsson Novi Lesner and Rusky Reno plants. Major political strikes had taken place at the Ericsson Telephone and Electrical Factory in 1905, 1912, 1914, and 1916. In 1913, the Novi Lesner machine factory had been the scene of one of the longest and most famous strikes in Russian labor history, lasting 102 days. A pitched battle between Reno auto, fa auto factory workers and soldiers and the police in October 1916 was one of the first signs of the impending storm that culminated a few months later in the fall of the Tsar. Now, as Lenin's train moved slugg sluggishly passed and drew to a noisy stop at the Finland station, all three factories were again shut down. Workers from the Reno, Ericsson, and Novi Lesner plants had been among the first to take to the streets the day before. As Lenin strode from the train, the scene at the Finland station was very different from the one which had greeted him in April. Then returning from exile, he had been met by crowds of workers and soldiers. There had been banners and flowers, a band and an honor guard of, of sailors. Even the leadership of the Soviet had made its appearance. Nikolai, um, I can't pronounce this, Chekhaidze, chairman of the Petrograd Soviet, had been among those welcoming Lenin in what formerly had been the imperial, imperial waiting room. On that occasion, Lenin had driven to Bolshevik headquarters, perched atop an armored car, accompanied by an imposing procession of party functionaries, workers, and soldiers. Now, as Bonch Bruvich hastened off in search of a taxi, there were no bands or welcoming speech speeches. An acrid odor of steam, stale food, and sweat permeated the humid summer air. Porters hustled about their tasks. From a booth draped in bunting, an el elderly matron with pace nay gesticulated wildly as she exhorted passers-by. Support our revolutionary soldiers. Sign your liberty, liberty loan pledges here. On the square outside throngs of workers and soldiers milled about, preparing to renew their demands for immediate peace and the transfer of power to the Soviets.
during the more than 200 years since its founding by Peter the Great, the Russian imperial capital, like pre-revolutionary Paris, had become divided into sharply defined socio-economic districts. Generally speaking, the central sections of the city encompassing the southern parts of Vasilevsky Island and the Petersburg side on the right bank of the Neva, and much of the left bank extending from the river to the Avodny Canal were the domain of the upper and middle classes, while most factory workers lived and worked in the outer industrial districts. The central sections boasted the luxurious Rococo and neoclassical palaces of the royal family and high aristocracy, the massive edifices that served as headquarters for imperial officialdom, the imposing Isaac and Kazan cathedrals, and the granite river and canal embankments, which together made Petrograd one of Europe's most beautiful capitals. Here too were centers of Russian culture, such as the Royal Marinsky Theater, home of the opera and the famed Imperial Ballet, the Royal Alexandrinsky Theater, where the best in European drama and comedy alternated with the classics of Gogol, Turgenev, and Tolstoy, and the Petersburg Conservatory, on whose stage the most accomplished musicians of the time performed. Also located in this central area on the left bank of the Neva were the capital's banks, offices, and better residential neighborhoods, which changed in character as one went further from the Admiralty, the hub of the city, from aristocratic palaces through professional apartment houses to the tenements of the lower middle class. Originating at the Admiralty and dominated by its needle spire was Nevsky's Nevsky Prospect, Petrograd's broadest and finest avenue with the city's most fashionable shops, while across the Neva to the north, the embankment at the eastern end of Vasilevsky Island was lined by the distinctive buildings of St. Petersburg University, the Russian Academy of Sciences, and the Academy of Fine Arts. Lost my place. Three symbols of Russian intellectual and artistic achievement, and by the columned facade of the stock exchange. The major factories of Petrograd were located in the dist in the districts surrounding this central area. In the Narva, Moscow, and Alexander Nevsky districts, on the left bank of the Neva and in the more remote areas of Vasilevsky Island in the Okta and Vyberg districts on its right bank. On the Petersburg side, surrounded by a formal garden and protected by a high ornate wrought iron fence, was the spacious and elegant Shazinskaya mansion, the former residence of Matilda Shazinskaya, prima ballerina of the Marinsky Ballet, and reputed to have been the mistress of Tsar Nicholas II. Sh Shizinskaya had fled the mansion during the February days, after which it had been taken over by soldiers of an armored car division quartered nearby. In early March, the Bolsheviks, then operating out of two cramped rooms in the attic of the Central Labor Exchange, requested and received permission from the soldiers to make the building their headquarters. In short order, the Central Committee, the Petersburg Committee, and the Bolshevik military organization were comfortably established in different parts of the mansion. From the Bolsheviks' point of view, the Shazinskaya mansion was ideally situated. A stone's throw from the Peter and Paul Fortress and the Cirque Modern, Cirque Mod Modern <laughs> a cavernous concert, and assembly hall, now the scene of frequent political rallies, it was also close to many military barracks, as well as to the teeming factories in the Vyberg district. The move to the Shazinskaya mansion coincided with the party's spurt in membership and popularity following the February Revolution. The new headquarters over which flew the Red Standard of the Central Committee soon became a magnet for disgruntled workers, soldiers, and sailors.
The mansion's spacious basement housed the military organization's Club Pravda, while the grounds outside the building became the scene of round-the-clock rallies. Each day from early morning until late at night, Sergei Bagdativ or Moise Volodarsky or another of the party's more popular agitators could be seen atop a rostrum overlooking the street haranguing crowds of passersby. Approximately once a week, elected representatives of party committees in the various districts of the capital assembled at the Shezinskaya mansion for business meetings. It was to a stunned late night gathering of some 300 party leaders in the ornate white columned drawing room that Lenin had first personally outlined his new program upon his return to Petrograd on the night of April 3rd. Several weeks later, the mansion was the meeting place for the Bolsheviks' April conference. Not everyone was quite as pleased by this arrangement as were the Bolsheviks. By late spring, Shezinskaya was determined to get her house back, evidently more for the purpose of expelling the Bolsheviks than out of any desire to return to it herself. In late April and May, she badgered both the government and the Petrograd Soviet about e evicting the Bolsheviks, and ultimately she took the matter to court. Subsequently, a justice of the peace had given the party 20 days to vacate the mansion, but the Bolsheviks, on various pretexts, had delayed the move. It was to this beehive of radicalism that many of the demonstrating soldiers and workers came on the evening of July 3rd, while thousands of marchers chanting, all power to the Soviets waited impatiently for instructions. Party leaders from the military organization and the Petersburg Committee gathered in the mansion's master bedroom, debated what action to take, and ultimately agreed to support openly and lead the movement on the streets. Lenin hastened to the Shezinskaya mansion around midday on July 4th. He had hardly been briefed on the latest events when some 10,000 Bolshevik-led sailors from Kronstadt most of them armed and battle-hungry, surrounded the building, demanding his appearance. At first, Lenin declined, asserting that his refusal to appear would express his opposition to the demonstration. But at the insistence of Kronstadt Bolshevik leaders, he ultimately acquiesced. As he stepped out on the second floor balcony to address the sailors, he grumbled to some military organization of officials. You should be thrashed for this. Lenin's ambivalent comments on this occasion reflected his dilemma. He voiced a few words of greeting, expressed certainly that the slogan, all power to the Soviets would triumph in the end, and concluded by appealing to the sailors for self-restraint, determination, and vigilance. Years later, one of Lenin's listeners recalled that for many of the sailors, Lenin's emphasis on the necessity of a peaceful demonstration was unexpected. Anarchists among them and some Bolsheviks as well were unable to see how a column of armed men eager for battle could restrict itself to an armed demonstration. Lenin now found himself in an untenable situation. The previous day's developments had reconfirmed that among workers and soldiers in the capital, the provisional government had little support. The Soviet leadership, however, was still determined not to yield to mass pressure. Majority socialists remained convinced that neither the provincial population nor the army at the front would support a transfer of power to the Soviets, and that in any case it was necessary for all the vital forces of the country to work together in the interests of the war effort and the survival of the revolution. They feared that by breaking with the liberals in the business and industrial circles who supported them, they would run the risk of weakening the war effort and enhancing the likelihood of a successful counter-revolution. Because of the Soviets' refusal to take power, the slogan, all power to the Soviets, was, at least for the time being, tactically bankrupt from the Bolsheviks' point of view. The choice now facing the party was whether to attempt to seize power by force or to mount an effort to end the demonstrations. In weighing these alternatives, Lenin considered the potential reaction of the provinces and the front to be of decisive importance. In this regard, the situation was no doubt fluid and unclear, but the immediate in indications were not very promising. Bolsheviks' support continued to be weak among the peasantry, while many soldiers were still loyal to the Soviet leadership. <laughs>
On the afternoon of July 4th, the extent of support for direct revolutionary action in the capital itself was by no means certain. The Kronstadt sailors were present in force and spoiling for a fight en route from the Shesenskaya mansion to the Turida police. They engaged in a confused gun battle with snipers firing from upper story windows and rooftops on Nevsky Prospect and broke into scores of houses and apartments, terrorizing the occupants. But some of the troops who had participated in the demonstrations the previous evening had already wearied of the event, while other garrison units still refused to take sides. Moreover, the possibility of the Bolsheviks seizing power independently of and in opposition to the Soviet had never been presented to the workers and soldiers. Indeed, while there is evidence that this contingency had been considered by a few top party officials before July, specifically by Lenin and by leaders of the Bolshevik military organization, it had not been discussed within the party leadership generally. So the potential reaction to a called battle even of many Bolshevik leaders, not to speak of their followers, was impossible to gauge. All this suggested the advisability of a quick retreat, yet that alternative also had drawbacks. The party was already compromised. The Bolsheviks' program and agitational work had obviously helped inspire the street movement. Banners carried by the demonstrators bore Bolshevik slogans. Pressured by its garrison converts, the Bolshevik military organization, without authorization from the Central Committee, had helped organize the movement in the first place. To be sure, on the afternoon of July 3rd, the Central Committee had made genuine attempts to hold back the movement. However, only a few hours later, with the demonstration already in progress, the leadership of the military organization and the Petersburg Committee, followed belatedly by the Central Committee, had reversed the party's earlier stand and publicly endorsed the demonstrations. Subsequently, the military organization took full control of the movement and began mobilizing the most formidable and broadest possible military support. The organization had, among other things, summoned reinforcements from the front, dispatches or dispatched armored cars to seize key posts and bridges and sent a company of soldiers to occupy the Peter and Paul fortress. There's no published record of the deliberations of the Bolshevik leadership on July 4th. Given the circumstances, it is doubtful that any record was kept. Mikhail Kalinin, a ranking Bolshevik participant, later recalled that at this point, Lenin's mind was open on the question of whether the movement in the streets was the beginning of the seizure of power Lenin did not exclude the possibility of throwing regiments into battle in favorable circumstances, or alternatively of ultimately retreating with as few losses as possible. As he pondered how the party might extricate itself from its exposed position, Lenin almost certainly received conflicting evidence or advice, sorry. Right Bolsheviks on the Central Committee, in view of their tactical stance on the development of the revolution and their opposition to measures, risking a decisive rupture with the moderate socialists, must have been strongly opposed to seizing power in defiance of the all-Russian executive committees. Other authoritative figures who probably appealed for caution on this occasion were Trotsky and Grigory Zinoviev. Among associates in the party, the curly-haired Pudgy Zinoviev, the son of a Jewish dairyman, was known primarily for his talents as a writer and party organizer. During the decade before the revolution, Zinoviev was probably Lenin's closest assistant and political confidant. Zinoviev returned to Russia with Lenin in April 1917 and subsequently became an editor of Pravda and a prominent member of the Bolshevik fraction in the Petrograd Soviet. 34 years old in 1917, Zinoviev was often given to al alternate fits of elation and depression. An internationalist on the war issue and receptive in theory to the possibility of an early socialist revolution in Russia, in political behavior, Zinoviev nonetheless tended to be vastly more cautious than Lenin. In early June, for example, he firmly opposed the organization of a mass demonstration 
on the grounds that such action would, would herald a new stage in the revolution, for which the Bolsheviks were unprepared. At the afternoon Central Committee meeting on July 3rd, both Zinoviev and Trotsky supported the demands of Kamenev and others that the party mobilize its forces to restrain the masses. At a subsequent meeting of party officials late that night, after assuring themselves that there was nothing the Bolsheviks could do to prevent a continuation of the protest the next day, Zinoviev and Trotsky took the side of those who argued that the party should endorse and control the movement. At the same time, they were adamant in their insistence that the demonstrations be peaceful. Some of the Petersburg Committee members who had favored applying pressure on the All-Russian Executive Committee in the past were probably cool to the idea of escalating the action on July 4th. In June, the volatile Volodarsky, for one, had supported the organization of mass demonstrations as a means of disrupting the war effort, of retaining the loyalty of the increasingly impatient working class population, and, if possible, of forcing the majority socialists to form an all-socialist government. In Volodarsky's view, the best interests of the revolution demanded the creation of a Soviet government in which a broad coalition of left, left socialist groups would work together. As an active member of the Petrograd Soviet, with close ties to both workers and soldiers, however, Volodarsky was keenly aware of the loyalty of these groups to the Soviet. He would not have advocated overthrowing the provisional government against the will of the Soviet leadership. Among the Petrograd Bolsheviks, there were also militants who on the afternoon of July 4th probably argued for decisive military action. One of the most influential of these ultra-radical local leaders was the Latvian Martin Latsis, representative of the powerful Vyberg District Bolshevik Organization. In the course of preparations for the abortive June 10th demonstration, Latsitz had taken steps to ensure that the marchers would be fully armed. Along with the Central Committee's equally aggressive Ivar Smilga, a Lithuanian Latsis had urged that the party be ready to the railway stations, arsenals, banks, the post office, and telegraph. During the period of rising unrest on the eve of the July days, he was critical of the party for playing the role of firemen among the masses. And on the night of July 3rd, after the uprising had begun, he objected to the Central Committee's determination to avoid decisive confrontation with the government. Top military organization figures, among them Nikolai Podvoisky and Vladimir Nevsky, both longtime Bolsheviks, were similarly inclined. A veteran of street combat against government authorities in 1905, Podvosky, 37 year, years old in 1917, had the reputation of an ultra-radical. In the days immediately after the overthrow of the Tsar, Podvosky reportedly was the first to declare that the revolution is not over, it is just beginning. Nevsky from Rostov on the Don had at one time been a brilliant student in the natural sciences faculty at Moscow University. In the 1920s, he would distinguish himself as an historian of the Russian revolutionary movement. Along with Pod Pod fuck, Podvosky, he had been active in the earliest Bolshevik fighting squads and military organizations. In memoirs relating to his activity in 1917, Nevsky invariably boasted about the independence and radicalism of the military organization leadership at this time and about its active involvement in the organization of the July Uprising. According to him, on July 4th, military organization leaders waited for a signal from the Central Committee to carry the affair to its conclusion. Several hours after Lenin's return to Petrograd, word reached the Shazinskaya mansion of two new factors that were ultimately of decisive importance. First, it was learned that the helplessness of the government the unwillingness of garrison units to come to the rescue of the government or the Soviet, the threat posed by the arrival of the Kronstadt sailors at the Tirida Palace, and expanding anarchy and bloodshed in the streets had impelled the all-Russian executive committees to call for troops from the front to re-establish order. In response to this appeal, Menshevik and SR-controlled army committees on the northern front 
were already forming composite detachments for immediate dispatch to the capital. Second, word was leaked to the Bolsheviks that high-level government officials were attempting to mobilize garrison troops against the Bolsheviks by accusing Lenin of having organized the July uprising at the behest of enemy Germany. The charge that Lenin was a German agent was not new. The writer's press had been leveling such accusations since his return to Russia through Germany. Lenin's known opposition to the war effort made him particularly vulnerable to this charge. Apparently, the provisional government had begun investigating the possibility of Bolshevik collusion with the enemy in late April after a German, um, after a German agent, one Lieutenant Ermolenko, had turned himself into the Russian general staff and had alleged in the course of interrogation that Lenin was one of many German agents then operating in Russia. This occurred about the time of the April crisis, just when the Bolsheviks were becoming a serious nuisance to the provisional government. Members of the cabinet were inclined, quite likely, to believe these allegations. In any case, the prospect of discrediting the Bolsheviks in the eyes of the masses had great appeal. And so three cabinet members, Kerensky, Nekrasov, and Tereshenko, were assigned to facilitate the inquiry. Several intelligence agencies in Petrograd and at the front became involved. Indeed, a special counter-espionage bureau attached to the Petrograd military district seems to have devoted most of its attention to building a case against the Bolsheviks. Among other things, this agency monitored the party's communications and kept its leaders under surveillance, all with the enthusiastic support of the Minister of Justice, Pavel Perevrusev. Only the counter-espionage bureau, he is reported to have declared, could save Russia. It is now known that during World War I, the Germans expended a substantial sum for the purpose of disrupting Russian internal affairs, and that a portion of this money was funneled to the Bolsheviks. Relevant sources suggest, however, that most Bolshevik leaders, not to speak of the party's rank and file, were unaware of these subventions. While Lenin seems to have known of the German money, there is... I lost my place again. While Lenin seems to have known of the German money, there's no evidence that his policies or those of the party were in any way influenced by it. Ultimately, this aid did not significantly affect the outcome of the revolution. As for the July events, the charge that the uprising was instigated by Lenin in cooperation with the Germans was obviously groundless. From mid-June on, as we have seen, Lenin had worked with energy to prevent an insurrection from breaking out. At the time of the July days, the official investigation of Lenin's German connections, such as they were, was incomplete. But with the government apparently on the verge of being overthrown, officials of the counter-espionage bureau decided to act with all deliberate speed. They concocted a plan to use the bits and pieces of incriminating evidence already collected to convince representatives of previously neutral garrison units, not only that the Bolsheviks were recipi recipients of German funds, but also that the street demonstrations were being directed by the Germans. If the plan worked, they reasoned, garrison units would provide the troops necessary to defend the government, restore order, and arrest the Bolsheviks. The scheme was presented to Pereversev and he gave it his approval. Defending his decision several days later, the Minister of Justice explained, I felt that releasing this information would generate a mood in the garrison that would make continued neutrality impossible. I had a choice between a proposed definite elucidation of the whole of this grand crime's root, roots and threads by some unspecified date or the immediate putting down of a rebellion that threatened the overturn, the overturn of the government. Thus, late on July 4th, the Counter-Espionage Bureau 
invited representatives of several garrison regiments to general staff headquarters where they were briefed on the case against Lenin. All witnesses agreed that these representatives were genuinely shocked by the disclosures. For their part, officials of the Bureau were so encouraged by the apparent potency of their case that they decided to make portions of the evidence available to the press. Because officials of the Counter Espionage Bureau were concerned that accusations against Lenin coming directly from government agency or directly from a government agency would be suspect, two outraged citizens, Grigory Aleksinsky, a former Bolshevik representative in the Duma, and V. Pankratov, an SR, were hastily recruited to prepare a statement on the charges for immediate circulation to newspapers. It should be emphasized that the actions of the Counter Espionage Bureau, the Minister of Justice, and later Aleksinsky and Pankratov were taken without the sanction of the full cabinet. As it turned out, at the time of the July uprising, ministers Nekrasov, Terechenko, and fuck, I'd, Lvov felt, stra <laughs> felt strongly that while the Bolsheviks were indeed receiving money from the Germans, the evidence against Lenin then in the hands of the government was inconclusive and that premature disclosure would prevent any possibility of ever substantiating it. During the evening, during the evening of July 4th, Lvov had personally appealed to all newspapers to withhold publication of the charges against Lenin. Of course, the information already passed to regimental represent, re representatives could not be prevented from spreading throughout the garrison. And the impact of the disseminated charges, together with rumors of massive troop movement from the front, was decisive. At 1 a.m. July 5th, Previously neutral regiments began marching to the Tarita Palace, where the All-Russian Executive Committees were in session, to, pro to proclaim their loyalty to the Soviet and the government. The immediate crisis having passed, the Executive Committees quickly adopted a resolution pledging support to, re to what remained of the pro provisional government. The resolution also called for the convocation in two weeks of a meeting with representatives of provincial Soviets for the purpose of reaching a final decision regarding the composition of a future cabinet and the question of establishing a Soviet government. These developments late on July 4th, that is the dispatch of loyal troops from the front and the abrupt shift in the mood of a number of garrison regiments were of course fully as damaging for the Bolshevik cause as they were providential for the provincial government. By late evening, the effect of both factors on the mood of previously passive garrison units was already becoming apparent. In these circumstances, there wasn't time even to gauge the mood of the provinces. At two or three o'clock in the morning, July 5th, a gathering of Central Committee members took stock of the developing situation and resolved to call on workers and soldiers to terminate the street demonstrations. The party's retreat was made public in an un unobtrusive back page announcement in Pravda on July 5th. It has been decided to end the demonstrations, the announcement explained, because the goal of presenting the slogans of the leading elements of the working class in the army has been achieved. This explanation was transparently false. The goal of the radical um, elements in the Petrograd garrison and of the Bolshevik extremists who had triggered the July uprising in the first place had been the overthrow of the provisional government. In belatedly supporting the movement, most party leaders probably held out the hope that the pressure of the streets would be enough to force the all-Russian executive committees to take power into their own hands. As it turned out, neither the extremists' aims nor the more limited hopes of party moderates were realized. The impatient workers, soldiers, and sailors of Petrograd, who until now had flocked behind the Bolsheviks, emerged from the July experience compromised 
and temporarily at least, demoralized. At the same time, the resolve of the government of all moderate and conservative political groups and of the well-to-do classes generally to restore order at whatever cost and to have done with extremists once and for all was greatly intensified. Whether this defeat for the left would be decisive remained to be seen. In the meantime, isolated and exposed, the Bolsheviks were forced to turn to the unenviable task of somehow explaining their role in the unsuccessful insurrection, defending themselves against treason charges, and generally protecting themselves from the inevitable onslaught of reaction.